This week on Hangar Talk, an FAA weather cam may be coming to your pass. Avionics sales are on fire. Congress works to eliminate a four-letter word. Cub Drafters is going to get some of that good government cheese. Also, the aircraft market is hot, but maybe not as hot as it used to be. You ready to do some hangar talk, Ian? Let's do it, Jill. From AOPA, your freedom to fly. This is Hangar Talk. The 1056 turn right heading 130. Welcome final to Hangar Talk, everybody. I'm Ian Twombly. And I'm Jill Tallman. Jill, welcome. You're guest hosting this week because our colleague David Tulis is, um, I would say he's in like a secret location, but actually he's been posting on Facebook. He's in the Galapagos. Yeah. Rough, and rough I, beauty, right? And I'm trying not to hate him, but man, yeah. it is hard. It is hard. That's right. <laughs> um, so actually, he's even helping from afar because our guest this week is Howie Franklin. And this is somebody that Dave caught up with. He is the Cape Fear Airport Manager there in North Carolina. But maybe more importantly for the show, he is the former chief steward of Air Force One. That's so exciting. Um, Ian, I don't know if you knew this, but one of my in-laws uh, was in the Air Force, and he was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base, and hmm. he was part of the crew that maintained Air Force One. Oh, wow. No, I had no idea, actually. That's so cool. And he gifted me with this awesome print of Air Force One flying over Ra uh, Mount Rushmore. Oh, that's so cool. And so did he have to have some like, you know, top secret uh, clearance for all the cool like, you know, anti-missile stuff and everything that Air Force One is rumored to have? You know, he wouldn't go into details, but he did float a story one time that they had to be on their hands and knees with like manicure scissors, cutting the trimming the rug so that it was the, the exact correct um, oh my gosh. height. Only the military would do something right, like right. that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So it, you'll have to compare stories then with Howie when he comes on in a few minutes. But um, yeah. first, let's talk a little bit about the news. So, um, and I will say, stick with us. It's the end of the year. And that means, you know, slow a little bit from some of the aircraft manufacturers. But a couple of cool things we want to talk about. One is um, weather cams. I don't know, um, Joe, if you've ever used one, but they're mostly in Alaska and the Mountain West through Colorado and places where they're isn't otherwise reliable weather reporting. Um, and the FAA is trying to solicit now actually ideas for where some other cams would be useful. Yeah. If I lived in Alaska, I would want a weather cam stationed every 50 feet, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Right. It's just, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I can't imagine. So, um, they held a webinar, I believe it was, um, via YouTube. And so you can go on, they're asking for solicitation, like I said, about, where to put these. And because I guess some of them are maintained by the FAA and some are by third party, as I understand mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, um, I, I would think if you happen to be based at an airport near a body of water that, um, you know, is so sometimes foggy a long time mm -hmm. uh, into the middle of the day, a weather cam might be really good for you. Yeah. Yeah. And some of these are cool because what they'll do on these pages is they'll show you the current weather. So it's a picture of, I think, within the past 10 minutes. And then really what's incredible, I think super useful is they'll show you a clear day that is with with reference points. So basically you can say, OK, if, if I can see this mountain peak on this, uh, Im, you know, on this image that they're showing me, then I know that I have a certain visibility, let's say, or whatever it right. happens to be. So um, right. it's it's pretty neat. You can see here on the screen they have the visual references. Pretty useful. Yeah, yeah I would say so. Yeah. I um, I don't really have experience using the weather cams um, that the FAA network has, but I have used other weather cams and sort of the concept of using these reference points. So there was a flight kind of recently, actually, where it was really kind of foggy and I wasn't sure what the viz was. And then it's like, I knew that there's this other ridge and this other ridge is like two miles away. And so I thought, oh, okay, this is good to go or whatever the case is. And so it's, it's it is, that stuff can be really useful, especially where there are mountain passes. Yeah, I mean, this is this is bringing local knowledge to everybody. So mm. it's really a nice safety innovation. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. So um, check out the story on AOPA. It's got uh, all the information about kind of where to find these weather cams today, and then also how to give that feedback if you, like you said, you live close to a body of water and you feel like you might want one. All right, moving on. Avionics sales. Um, it's been... Uh, 
it's been an up and down couple of years because of COVID, but um, a story I've just published showed that uh, thanks to now we have the sales figures um, from recent sales and they're looking actually really good, Jill. Yeah, but you know what was interesting about this story, Ian, is that it's my thought when I saw the headline, I was like, okay, sure, people are not buying airplanes and they're retrofitting the ones they have to make them new mm -hmm. to them. But that's mm -hmm. not the case. Um, these are new avionics sales that are being reported. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. It is It is really interesting, actually, because I think what did the, um, the AEA report said that it was, uh, what, 4.6% up in the third quarter um, compared to, I think it was the second quarter, which is kind of interesting. Um, and a lot of that increase, as you say, is actually from manufacturers. It's not from the retrofit market. Right. The retrofit market is actually kind of flat Yeah. right now, which yeah. surprised me. But Yeah. Yeah. And also, too, I, I'm, it's really interesting when you think about this from a dollar perspective, because, of course, there are hundreds of thousands of used airplanes, pre-owned airplanes, whatever, that um, where people are putting in retrofit. But of course, many times they're putting in like onesie twosies, whereas the manufacturer is ordering like a G1000 or a G3000 or 5000, which is big money, right? Right. They're not going piecemeal. Yeah. They don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. So I think in total, it was like 2 billion in avionics sales for the first nine months of the year. It's incredible. Um, that's an 18.3% increase from 2021's first nine months. That's fantastic. Well, I just wondered if, um, this is the, you know, these, these good numbers for new avionics is also an, an indication that the supply chain is loosening up. That is a, hmm. a guess on my part, but I'm wondering if yeah. you think that. That's interesting. I mean, um, Actually, I'm writing a story for for Pilot right now about it. And just, you know, one data point being Garmin, they say, yeah, OK, the, there's still difficulty. They think it's it's lessened in some areas. They weren't really specific. Um, I mean, it has to be right. There has to be some supply chain loosening. Of course, there's this cascade effect, right, where the manufacturers can only put out so much because they have these supply chain problems. And then, of course, they're looking to the avionics folks. They can maybe sell more. Um, but, uh, then maybe part of the supply chain is from avionics. And so you get this sort of snowball impact. I think that that's, that's probably the case I would guess. Yeah. It right. does make you wonder how much more could they sell if they didn't have those challenges. Right. Yeah. All right. Jill, Loda, four letter word. <laughs> how long have we A been talking about crap. this now? Yeah. Right. <laughs> how long, how long have we been talking about this? Oh, it's been, a, has, has it been a full year or has it been two years? It feels like forever. Uh yeah. It does feel like forever. Yeah. Uh, we're close. We're very close. Um, so AOPA through congressional partners is uh, very close, I would say, to having the load of provision that the FAA put in place completely stripped out. That's part of the defense appropriations bill. Um, that is, uh, as we record, this has just passed the house is going to go through the Senate will be passed probably. And the president will sign it. So yeah, owners and instructors of experimentals, warbirds, um, and some others, you know, they've had to get these special requests in, uh, to be able to, to instruct, which is just, uh, as, as Mark Baker points out in the story, it's like, you know, it's, it's what's meant to be helpful to safety is actually the opposite. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and uh, not even the FAA uh, liked it all that much, which which begs the question: Then why why did they do it? But um, yeah. Yeah. former FAA uh, administrator Steve Dixon, uh, he was the one that called Loda a four letter word. So mm -hmm. I don't have any problems with that. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, goodbye, good riddance, right? Yeah. We should say, Jill, before we go, just that. Um, a couple of folks who, in Congress who help us very often and, and have helped us again here. Sam Graves, who we talk about often from Missouri, Rick Larson from Washington, James Inhofe, of course, Senator from Oklahoma, so and, and a few others. So we'd like to thank them and really excited to finally ease this burden for um, those in the experimental and Warburg communities. Yeah, it really helps to have pilots in uh, Congress. Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. It's fantastic. Okay. Hey, um, you mentioned this at the top of the show, Cub Crafters, who's just been going on fire because of the backcountry market and how much that's expanding and how fast. Speaking of supply chain, they can't build airplanes fast enough. Well, now they have another customer and it's the government. 
Yeah, General Aviation News brings us this story, uh, and and they are telling us that the United States Department of Agriculture is going to purchase a fleet of X Cubs. They're going to be using these for a variety of uh, tasks in several agencies, including Homeland Security, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Agriculture. The U.S. Air Force Flight Academy, lucky guys there, lucky yeah. uh, men, and, lucky men and women there who get to fly them, and the United States Air Force Research Laboratory. Fantastic, yeah. So, wow, the hugely broad range of uh, agencies there flying those. So, um, the only one I was aware of really was like the, um, I guess, fish and I don't even know if it was Fish and Wildlife or. Um, I don't know, BLM or whomever, you know, operated the super cubs for years. And so, Mm -hmm. of course, these are probably going to replace some of those. But that is uh, that's that's really cool. It really is. And, um, you know, I was sitting here thinking what uh, what comparable airplane is out there that could do all the things that are going to be required of these aircraft? The only one I could come up with was the Aviat Husky. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The X Cub has that reputation as being such a beast, right? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, and GA News, as you say, has the story, and they've got a picture, thanks to Cubcrafters, with it on its giant Tundra tires. And so, yeah. That's, oh yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, that's a really cool and and uh, like we say, I think just a, a fantastic range of uses for that airplane, which is incredible when you think about just kind of how and light it is and all the different missions that it can fulfill. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, just want to finish up today talking a little bit about the aircraft market. Of course, we hit this on a fairly regular basis in part because it's been so nutty out there, um, as we all know. So yeah. Adam Meredith, who's um, in charge of AOPA Aviation Finance, wrote a little quarterly summary recently. It's on the website, so definitely check it out. And um, he gets into some detail about essentially what they're seeing. And of course, they have a great uh, vantage point for the market being that people are calling interested in financing. And then I think also importantly, how many deals are they actually closing? Um, because one thing that they're showing is that if you're a finance buyer, maybe sometimes you're missing out on uh, to cash buyers. This to me was is a good news, bad news scenario because mm-hmm. um, the market appears to be loosening up, but there's still not a whole lot of inventory out there for you yeah. to choose from. So I don't know. What do you do? Do you sit tight and wait for things to loosen up even more or do you go out there and get what's out there? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think they it's been an interesting year. Um, Adam's summary sort of paralleled. Uh, I, I did a story for Turbine Pilot a couple months ago about the turbine market and what's going on there. And it's sort of paralleled where over the summer, I don't know if it was because of rate hikes or, or what, there was definitely a dip in activity and inventory started to go up a little bit. Um, but then something happened in kind of the third quarter where things reversed again and inventory was way low and buyers came out. And they said it was a bit about kind of what you're saying, which is that um, that people were waiting. They were, they were thinking it was a bubble. And then they saw even with rate hikes and the economy kind of slowing down a little bit that the demand was still there and they thought, okay, well, if I'm ever going to get in, you got to get in now, right? Um, there's no more point in waiting. And so they were seeing actually more buyers come in. And I think that's kind of what Adam is saying a little bit in the story as well. Um, there's also, of course, the factor of the fourth quarter and bonus depreciation, uh, which they think is really going to drive sales through the end of the year. Sure. Yeah. Next year, we'll see, right? Um, right. It's like normal predictions just don't hold true anymore. I think there's uh, there's... Too much instability in the larger economy. This is true. and you know, But you know, Ian, it is entertaining to watch the market because there's always somebody out there who's got like a 70-year-old um, Cessna 172 and they're asking $150,000 mm-hmm. for it, I you know, know, with original avionics and original paint. Yeah, and right. And you're like, you're like, really? I- yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So- it's fun. <laughs> So you are, uh, you're part owner of a 182. Is that right? You're in a, no, you're in a actually I sold my share in the 182. I'm between airplanes at the moment. You did. Oh, okay. I so did. you sold it with the market hot. Did you make more money on your share than you had? Did you make money on the share? Did you sell it for did. more than you bought it for? Yeah. I did. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like houses. Now you have to roll that back into something that's going to be more expensive as a result of the what's yeah, going on. Yeah, that's what I'm finding out. Um, yeah. I'm I'm looking. You know, I I'm I'm like everybody else. I look at trade a plane. I you know I look at the bulletin boards, and 
if I was to go out and buy another airplane, I think it would have to be um, an ultralight. <laughs> At this point. <laughs> and I'm yeah. not making fun of ultralight folks. No. Because they are, you know, they're out there having fun in their affordable airplanes. So. Yes, that's right. It is a crazy time. There's no question. Um, yeah. So just to put a, a couple of quick numbers to it as uh, before we leave for the day, um, they saw, you know, Adam described the demand as choppy, second quarter, third quarter as choppy. And May activity was down 10% versus the month prior. Then in June, it bounced back up 7%. Um, so it's kind of been, you know, ping ponging all, all over the place. Um, so we'll see, uh, about, uh, about next year. I, I think everyone's kind of holding their breath a little bit. Absolutely. Just, you yeah. know, wait, wait and see. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Jill. So, um, Air Force One, I can't wait for you to hear the, the interview to see, uh, you know, your with your in-laws and you guys can compare stories because I, I will be curious as to maybe, you know, if your in-law was the one who cut the carpet, Howie was the one who then had to go and vacuum it, you know, before, uh, before <laughs> the true. flight. Yeah. Who takes care of that little detail? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're here at Cape Fear Regional Jet Port slash Howie Franklin Field in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Howie, what is it like to have an airport named after yourself? This is quite unusual. Someone who's living someone who is a, a, a local celebrity of sorts. What's it like? It's fantastic. When, when the board decided to do that, I went home and told my wife, who was a former Air Force One crew member also, I said, hey, guess what? They named the airport, airport after me and I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had brought them millions of dollars worth of grants. We got lucky, and the people supported us and things of that nature. Plus, we had a uh, $75,000 budget when I came here, and now we have $1.6 million budget. From 75000 75, to $1.6 million. When did you come to the Cape Fear area? Uh, I originally came here in 1990 with my wife. And we took a look at the area, and I went down to the East Beach, uh, to uh, Oak Island, mm -hmm. and she drove me down the end of the island, and I got out of the car, and I walked through sand dunes and sea oats, and then I come out on this gorgeous ocean, okay, and I turn, there's an inlet, and then there's a waterway. Well, I'm from the south shore of Long Island. It looks just familiar, okay? I was okay? going to say, probably did. However, it was January 11th. It was 72 degrees. And you, So you started with Gerald Ford. At Air Force One. Right. Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton. He's guilty, but he's a nice guy. Yeah, understood. So, so uh, Reagan, who was uh, sort of the, you know, the, the movie star president, I, I photographed him back in the 80s. I was stationed in Washington, D.C. for a little while, too. And you're right. He knew exactly where to stand. Uh, he, made, he made a great subject for the news photographers. What was he like to work with from uh, your end? For eight years, I laid for him trying to catch him being phony. Oh, really? Hey, I mean, unfairly. Yeah. I thought, I'm going to, I wake him up, put him to bed, I'm going to catch this guy being something other than you see on television. Yeah. Never did. Pretty genuine guy. He was genuine one. If you woke him up, he looked like the damn president. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. If I went into his stateroom, okay, and did something insignificant, he's sitting at his desk doing work and brought him in a fresh glass of ice water. He would do something non-verbally or verbally to raise my self-esteem. That's a boss. That's really, that's really interesting. And I try to catch him being phony. And he, he was incredible. He was, uh, he was a, if you got around him physically, in eight feet of him, you felt energy. Interesting. I want to hear a couple of uh, stories that no one's ever heard about. Give me one story that you haven't told. Well, I, one of the things I tell, you know, uh, I talked about Ronald Reagan, and he liked California. Uh -huh. If we were going into Ohio, he would say to me, Howie, we're going in the right direction, but not far enough. <laughs> oh, because you're going west, but right. not all the way. One time we were going to Texas, and he came on the airplane a little late, and he looked at me, he said, Howie, they're sending me to Texas. I said, yes, sir. He said, yeah, but they're sending me to a turkey shoot. Oh. I said, oh. He said, yeah, but I got enough turkeys in Washington. I don't need to go to Texas. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, one time we were going to California with Ronald Reagan, and he, he was in the conference room, and he was doing paperwork on one end of the conference room, and the staff was on the other end, and they're doing their work. They finished early. They started chit-chatting. And at the time, uh, Mickey Rooney was still alive. 
And they would, Hollywood at that time was considering doing a life story of a movie, a life story of Mickey Rooney. So they, that was the discussion. The president's over here working, writing, things of that nature. Nobody thinks he's paying attention. And uh, so anyway, they finally came up with this question, well, I wonder who they're going to get to play Mickey Rooney. And they mentioned a few names. And so somebody in the group says, well, why don't they get Mickey Rooney to play Mickey Rooney? And the president looked at the group and said he's too short. That's pretty good. I like that. That's awesome. He just off the cuff while he was signing papers. Oh, yeah. He that. would do that. If you talk, at one time, George H. Bush, I was flying with him, and we're going to California, had a meeting with Reagan. I said, did he tell you a story? He said, oh, yeah. He's going to tell, Reagan's going to tell you a story. But, you know, there was a lot of, on Air Force One, it was kind of like a professional MASH operation. Remember what MASH on television? Sure. You had a lot of humor. I mean, you had... You, you had to be careful on politically, you could step on the wrong toes. The sure. president normally was the easiest person on the airplane. Senior staff, staffers were the wrong ones. They're, they're, they're manipulating power and things of that nature. So uh, there was a lot of humor went on. Now, now at, for a time, the news uh, organizations also flew aboard Air Force One. Then they split it up and had them on a an aircraft that followed Air Force One. Did well, they have see? both. They still, on this day, there's a press area on Air Force One. And uh, there used to be about eight. Now, there, I think there's 14 press and there's a camera crew. There's either going to be a CBS, NBC, CNN, one of those correspondents. Mm -hmm. And then the, there's a press plane that follow them. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't know, everybody on Air Force One, uh, if I had a breakfast meal, whatever I spent on the breakfast meal, I divided by 100 people because that's who I, how many I had, including crew. Right. So that's what we charge. Everybody gets charged for their meals They're and not their beverages. For free. No, because they're getting per diem. Right. Okay, now the press, the way it used to be, they pay a coach fare yeah. plus a dollar, plus I give them a bill for their food and their, and their beverages. Okay. So everybody pays for it. I bet the beverage uh, bill was kind of high. Well, not... <laughs> There was a time, it's better, it's, I don't know how it is right now, but there was a time where there was a lot of alcohol consumed on Air yeah, Force One, yeah. and finally they kind of grew out of that. Uh, and uh, it's a lot, probably less alcohol consumed than back in the Nixon, uh, Ford, uh, President Carter days, things of that nature. So you flew Carter around too? Yes, sir. I, mean, I, I saw a picture of you with uh, Miss Lillian. Miss Lily and the mother, she, she was a character. Yeah. Uh, we were going to Golda Meir's funeral, oh. who was a former Brooklyn school teacher that became the president of Israel. Oh, wow. And uh, she got on the aircraft, and I had never, but you know, these are southern genteel folks. And I was, you know, Jimmy Carter, they didn't drink or they didn't yeah. have any booze or anything like that. But his mother came on the airplane, looked at me, and she said, I'll have a bourbon and branch. Oh, wow. Okay, I didn't know. Were I'm from Long Island. Well, I was prepared for it, but I didn't know what branch was. It's water. Branch it's a southern water. term. Yeah. Sure. And she was a character, and uh, she was playing cards with the, with the senators in the front of the airplane, taking their money, and then she'd go back and play with the Secret Service and take their money. She was really a character. Rosalind Carter, I traveled extensively with her because at the end of the, the Carter administration, when the Ayatollah had the hostages, President Carter right. reduced his campaign mm -hmm tremendously and they peeled myself and Denny Stump off another flight attendant off from the crew and we stayed with the first lady for, the, for about a year and a half so I became very close with her traveling with her uh, she's having her the 13th of August is her 94th birthday and I was invited to her birthday Are you party. Gonna go? Yes. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah, I'm from Atlanta, so they were they were like our neighbors, you know, in America's Georgia, you know, 100 miles away. Yeah, yeah. But they're delightful folks. Yeah. You know, very, very well, much. Well, they've, so. they've, they've visited a lot of other countries once he was out of office mm -hmm. as well. So he probably took that that background that it was established as the president and, and saw, you know, different things that he could do to help out with, you know, with other people, underprivileged mm -hmm. countries and things like that. So tell us a little bit about, we don't hear much about the Clinton administration, flying with the Clintons. What was that like? Well, it, uh, you know, um, I'm, it ended up I was one year younger than Bill Clinton. Okay. So he, it was the first president I had that I listened to rock and roll. Okay. Predominantly. There you go. You know, and uh, I kind of liked that one time. And when we designed the 747, we never had a musician as a president or somebody that was really avid to listen to mu music. So the, the radio operators messed up a little bit. If he wanted to listen to music in his stateroom, the whole airplane had to listen to it 
and he liked loud rock and roll like me. So I went and talked to the radio operators. We bought a, a, a box, you know. A, a like a boom box or something? Boom box, yeah. Oh. We put Air Force One on it, and I presented it to him. I said, sir, you can listen to this in your own room. I said, sir, in the old days, they would have rewired this airplane for $2 million. And he said, you guys are reinventing government. <laughs> so he's got his own boom box, and we had uh, generators that he can take to a, we're in a foreign country and, and listen to it with, and take it with him. So one day I walked into the stateroom and he was playing Cecilia, You're Breaking My Heart real loud. Uh -huh. And he looked at me and said, how is this too loud? I said, sir, I've been waiting for a guy like you to come along for a long time. I like it. Did he play his saxophone on Air Force One? I don't remember him doing that, but he, listen, I watched him, he would do the New York Times, my customers here, the big executive airplanes, uh -huh. two newspapers. I better have the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Sure. Air Force One, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. He would do the New York Times crossword puzzle in 10 to 15 minutes. Carry on business at the same time. Wow. Yeah, he wow. was sharp. That is amazing. And But I used to, you know, he was one year younger than me. Um, I think we crossed the line with Clinton because... Uh, we're supposed to maintain a professional relationship with him, but he came almost friendship yeah. professional. Yeah. And that, he kind of wanted that to a certain, to an extreme, because you know we were the only people we didn't ask him. We weren't asking him for anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we could pull each other's chain, so to speak. Understood. One one time we were going to uh, Florida, and I had seen the president's schedule, and he's campaigning for three or four days straight. Boom, boom, every day campaigning, two or three. So my friend Steve Lomanak, who lives here in, uh, now, he was one of my deputies, and I had him enter the stateroom from one end, and I entered the other way, and the president was maybe about eight feet away from us, and I was set this up. I s whispered to Steve, Steve, do you bring your golf clubs? The president turns, you guys playing golf? I said, yeah, we're playing golf. You're not playing golf? He said, I'll be damned. He said, I'm down here raising all this money for these people that can't give me four hours off to play golf? I said, yes, sir. He says, where are you playing golf? I said, we're playing golf at Doral. Oh, yeah. He says, you guys are playing at Doral. I said, yeah, we're playing there free because we know you. He goes, ah. <laughs> That's pretty good. So, I like that. There, one thing that these presidents, we put them, presidents, we put movie stars on a pedestal. They're mm -hmm. just like us. They are. They feel. They care. They hurt. They, they you know, they, they, they're fatigued. They're mm -hmm. long hours and things of that nature. So Now, I know they're like us to that degree, but there are other things on that aircraft, that Air Force One aircraft, that are, are particularly suited for the type of missions that y'all were doing. Tell me a little bit about the, um, the, the, some of the special engineering to get the food services well, going. And, and walk me through from the 707 days to the 747. Well, I think that might to be start out, one thing, the, the primary mission of Air Force One is to provide secure and safe air transportation, air transportation for the president. Yeah, it's a, it's a mobile office. Right. Second is to provide a, the same service as the White House would provide for the president, okay. only on an aircraft traveling throughout the world, as far as the office, like okay. you said. And my job was to provide a... Uh, a professional but comfortable atmosphere. The in other words, yeah, what I what I want them to do if we came out of China and whatever it was, they come back in the airplane. I want them to feel like they're back in America. Okay. I want them to feel like they're at home when you take your shoes off and relax, that type of thing. And we did such a good job at that. Sometimes we couldn't get them off the airplane. Uh, so that'd be fun. But as far as the the service and things on the airplane, um, the flight attendants, we would get an itinerary. And I would identify all the breakfast, lunches, dinners, breakfast, birthday parties, celebrations. Then we would select six flight attendants, more three in the front galley, three in the back galley. I let them make the plan, the menu, and then we'd submit that menu to the White House. They'd okay it. Then we go shopping. And uh, one of the things the 747 has is a great refrigeration units in the belly of the airplane, large units, large units upstairs. The galleys are probably, I would say, the finest galleys in the world because they let we let the the Boeing let the flight stewards get that involved with the engineers to design the galleys. And we looked at the galley. I said, look at that galley and where, how the meal comes in and goes out, and then how it comes back and gets cleaned up. Flow process chart, things of that nature. It's got room. 
Uh, they do. They can do anything. And the other thing is, we put a special power unit, ground power unit, on the airplane that, that the aircraft will maintain refrigeration anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day. Because you might end up in, being in Egypt. You might in, it'd be somewhere in the Middle East. It could be 110 degrees on the ramp. You never know. Best example of that is 707 in China. Uh, Barbara Walters was served a spam sandwich coming out of China. Okay. <laughs> okay, and she meant it on the Today Show. What actually happened behind the scenes? Everything we had was frozen in, in not good refrigerators. It was dry ice containers in the belly, frozen stuff. And uh, the Pan Am plane, the press plane, they got to go to Hong Kong and they got catering and stuff like that. We, didn't, we had what we could sit on the ground and, and maintain. So uh, she didn't like the meal and she asked for another sandwich and John Palmer, the flight attendant, served her a spam sandwich, a canned sandwich. Well, we didn't have the refrigeration. Because the airplane wasn't built for that. It wasn't built for right. that. And I, uh, Katie Kirk was one of the guests on the 747. I, I went out of my way to sit down with Katie and explain what happened to with Barbara, <laughs> Walters. Barbara Walters. But so the 747 was custom designed with that in mind, with service in mind. That probably was the first, uh, obviously was the first Air Force One aircraft with that overall arching goal in mind. Yeah, well, and they let the, the people in the workplace, in their work areas, get involved in the design. And that was the big advantage. And they was, Boeing was so successful as when they started building the 777, guess what? They brought in the crews finally. Oh, <laughs> and oh. they were very successful because of that. So it wasn't just the engineers, it was the people who actually used the facilities. Right. What do you know about the two Air Force Ones that are um, that are in production right now? Give us a lowdown on that. I know that you probably know some secrets. Well, stuff. what I've been told is two 747s, the larger ones, okay, uh -huh. and they were, I, what I was told, they were, they were ordered by the Russians and the Russians didn't take them, so we picked them up. They're in Texas and now they're doing a mod change inside. They've, I've heard recently they've been delayed the delivery about 17 months. but. The 747, to do what the, your president of the United States needs to do is the best facilities there is. The, the room, the space, um, the ability, it, it, it becomes the, really the flying White House. It's, I can't imagine another aircraft that can do a better job. So. That's, a, that's a serious understatement right there, but <clears throat> I know that it's a custom design. I think we're looking at a 707. Here. That's two 7,000. Richard Nixon ordered that airplane <clears throat> during uh, 1972. Uh -huh. Two 6,000 is in, in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. That's the aircraft that President Johnson was sworn in on. President Kennedy's body right. was bored, borked back. A famous photo uh, was made, made of that. I was just in Missouri at a Cherry Blossom Festival, and they had a lot of old TV TV stars and things of that nature, and uh, uh, President Eisenhower's granddaughter was there, and she was interviewing two uh, um, World War II veterans, and I went up to her. She remembered me because we also brought Mamie Eisenhower's body out of Washington, D.C., and we took it to Kansas, and she was on the airplane as a guest taking her back and she remembered me on the airplane. Oh so the, the Su-6000 has all the history. Two 7000 is in the Reagan Library yeah. and I was very blessed. Uh, my wife and I, my wife was a crew member, administrative assistant to the president on the airplane. I was working here many years ago. George W. was president and they, uh, the, the Reagan administration was able to convince uh, the people to give, donate the airplane, Two 7000, to the Reagan Library. And the Secretary of the Air Force office called up, and it was, uh, I was working by myself, moving airplanes, it's hot, it's in 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they called me up and they said, uh, we'd like you and Linda to uh, accompany the airplane out of Washington to fly it to California with other crew members and give it to Nancy Reagan. Oh, goodness. And I said, well, I thank you very much, but... Uh, I, I, until I, before I drive up there, why don't you utilize all the resources in the Washington area before we drive up there? I went home and told my wife, and she said, you said what? <laughs> Luckily, the Air Secretary of the Air Force Office called me back the yeah. next day and said, uh, Mr. Franklin, you don't understand, Nancy Reagan expects you and Linda to be there. So we did, and we flew up, and uh, we got on the airplane and flew out to California and gave it to Nancy Reagan. Our, our crew chief gave her the log books, and then they end up taking the airplane apart. They uh, took it to uh, to Simi Valley, and it's in a beautiful display. If you ever see something, you'll enjoy it. 
um, a, the Boeing did a fantastic job. The airplane's sitting here up, and the Marine One is on the bottom uh -huh. looking at it. So yeah. it's really set up very nice. So you spent 18 years in Air Force One now. Now, you were telling me a, a little while ago that you actually started working in that line of work with Henry Kissinger before Air Force One. We were working with some other personnel. Yeah, well, even before that, when I first got to Andrews in 1970, the Secretary of State was William Rogers. Okay. And we flew with him all over the world, and he was organized and uh, a very decent person to fly with. And then I flew with Doc Kistra when he was uh, head of National Security Council doing shuttle diplomacy things. Then he became Secretary of State, and I flew with him. Uh, if you work for Henry, you work for anybody. He was tough. He was tough. He was, and... Uh, but the people who worked for him on the staff when I was shuttle diplomacy with him when, during the Vietnam War and things of that nature was a guy named Al Haig. Who be, oh, yeah. He was full colonel, became Secretary of State. There was a guy named Rumsfeld, became oh, yeah. Secretary of Defense sure. on the staff. There was a guy named Winston Lord. He became the second ambassador to, to, to China. Okay? Um, there, there were so many people that worked for him as staffers that became very, very successful. Two of them became Secretary of State. Let's talk a little bit about the Kissinger shuttle diplomacy. A lot, a lot of people might not remember that. You were telling me a little while ago that, that one of the missions was to China. Well, now, That was unusual at the time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it happened. The first mission, we took him to Pakistan. We didn't know where we are going. We were going to Pakistan, and he left the airplane. And we found out later he went to China oh. on another aircraft. Oh. And then we went in with him into China before the Nixon to set up the mission and things of that nature. The one thing that during that period of time, China had a real uh, protocol. They were very big on protocol. But they were also trying to preach to us that everybody was equal. Yeah. <laughs> okay? We, when, when Kissinger went, other than his private meetings, whatever he went, we went with him. If he went to the opera the crew goes oh. we go to the great wall the crew goes oh. we'd rather go to the hotel yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. uh, uh, great having dinner in the great hall of red china with dr kister and their flight his flight crew okay and joe and Lai, and and they kept, they kept saying that everybody was equal but i i sorry i want you to know i saw a little few more people a little more equal than everybody else and, and understood yeah. understood also i was looking for great food and because uh, i've been to taipei and i've been to hong kong and you had um history as a chef as a sous chef when you were just a young boy you said you were 18 i'm right. sorry 16. 16 uh for an executive chef. And where was it that you worked with talisman you yacht club as you ought to Google it. It was fantastic. It was the jet set of the 60s. Uh, on Long Island? On, Long, on Fire Island. Fire Island, okay. And so you learned a little bit about culinary arts back then, and then you, you kind of fashioned that into really a lifelong career. Yeah, well, also on Air Force One, I found uh, I had uh, civil, uh, the um, CIA, uh, Culinary Institute of America, okay. tailored a course just for flight attendants. Oh. And oh. it was a two-week course just for... And so if you came out of that course, you knew everything about meat, you ever knew everything about sauces, you knew everything about desserts, you knew everything, two weeks tailored for things that we would prepare on Air Force One. So the, every, all the stewards were uh, Culinary Institute graduates, they were trained in bartending, trained in service. And I'll, I'll just relate that. On Air Force One, customer service. We, I used to preach that, look, today we've got a mission. Somebody's <coughs> going to be on this airplane that's never been on here before. We need to give them customer service. We want them to remember, have a great experience on Air Force One. That's how we run the airport here. Customer service is the biggest thing we got. The fact that we move airplanes, refuel airplanes, put airplanes in the hangar, those are tasks. But my people believe they bought into it, customer service. Um, so it's just a fascinating world, I think, Air Force One. There's just such mystique about it. Um, but we forget that there's lots of really dedicated, hardworking people behind the scenes who um, who I have to spend half of their lives on the road, right? Traveling whenever the president needs to travel. Exactly. This is an airplane that represents the president, represents the United States. So everything has to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Ian Twombly. Our editor is Austin Hansen. I'm Jill Tallman. And thanks for listening. And uh, Dave will be back next time where we will do the year-end wrap-up. You can follow us on uh, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for chipping in, Jill. 
thank you for having me. And if Dave decides not to come back from the Galapagos, I'm always here to fill in. All right. Good to know. (laughs) 